Thanks, Melissa. Well, welcome Community Foundation CEOs. It's so good to be with you all again. As a reminder, our Community Foundation CEO Roundtable Series is a collaborative effort between the Council on Foundations and CEONet. This is our first CEO Roundtable of 2022, and we're very pleased to have over 130 of you registered for this important and timely topic. So thank you for taking time out of your busy calendars to engage. Last July, the Council on Foundations began convening a group of community foundation leaders to develop a set of principles and policy recommendations to strengthen how community foundations use donor advice funds. The Strengthening Community Philanthropy Ad Hoc Working Group was made up of leaders of big and small community foundations from different types of communities, urban, rural, and suburban across the country. And I was privileged to be a part of that working group. And I'm really looking forward to the conversation we're about to have. We've been anxiously awaiting the opportunity to share the recommendations, answer questions, and gather input. We will have plenty of time for you to ask questions at the latter part of our roundtable. And as Melissa said, uh, you'll have the opportunity to put your questions in the Q&A box or to chat directly to Jen Holcomb or to raise your hand and be called on so you can ask your, your question directly. So I'll help moderate that. So uh, be jotting your questions down and ready to fire away when the time comes. So let's jump in. Joining us today to present the principles and policy recommendations are David Cass, the Vice President of Government Affairs with the Council on Foundations, and the following ad hoc working group members. Heather Peeler, President and CEO of ACT for Alexandria from Alexandria, Virginia. Walker Sanders, President of the Community Foundation of Greater Greensboro in Greensboro, North, North Carolina. And Debbie Wilkerson, President and CEO of the Greater Kansas City Community Foundation in Kansas City, Missouri. So I'll hand this off to you, David, to get the conversation started and share more about how these recommendations came to be. Great, um, well, thank you so much. And thank you everyone for coming today. We really appreciate it. Uh, you know, look, our sector has been talking about donor advised funds for a really long time, right? And at the council, we, we have members with lots of different perspectives, and, and that's great. You know, what's the best way to effectively and transparently use DAFs? And we know that they're an important tool in the philanthropic toolbox. Um, they're flexible, and that means you, they can be used to address both stuff right now and for the long term. Um, but we also recognize that there are some concerns about DAFs that are driven at times by misperceptions and in other cases by some valid criticism. So, so as Christy mentioned, so with that in mind, uh, the council convened a group of uh, community foundation CEOs to develop some principles and some policy recommendations uh, to strengthen community philanthropy's use of donor advised funds. And so you can see the working group members. And I know that, I think I saw Nancy Brown and Susie Nelson uh, also participating today. Um, so um, they, they met over a course of six months to develop these principles. And it is, you know, they were really had long, detailed, in-depth conversations. So first, I just wanna thank, on behalf of the council, thank each of the working group members you're gonna hear from a number of them to, to uh, talk through the recommendations. Um, we also, just before we released them a few weeks ago, we shared them with a limited group of people pre-release, just to you know, other community foundation CEOs, um, private foundation folks, some of our PO, PSO partners. And since the release, we've been having some more conversations. And you know, overall, the feedback's been positive, but we've received really good questions and, and suggestions of how to improve the recommendations. Um, you may have seen that when we released the recommendations at the beginning of February, Kathleen sent out an email, Kathleen and Ryder CEO, um, that we want to work with you. Uh, you know, what, what are ways that we can improve them? You know, what are the, this is a starting point for a conversation. It's not the end point. So uh, that's really our focus now is then having conversations and engaging more voices in our sector. And today's one of, we hope, many opportunities for you to ask questions and provide feedback. Uh, because over the coming weeks and months, we're going to continue to do that. So before I turn it over to the working group members to walk through them, um, I just wanted to address one question that we've heard a lot about. So, so why do the recommendations apply only to community foundations? 
And the answer is that that's just where we started. It's not where we want to end. You know, we didn't think, we don't think that there should be one set of rules for community foundation DAFs and another set for DAFs managed by other DAF sponsors. But as community foundation CEOs, the working group felt like they couldn't make recommendations that impacted all DAF sponsors without including them in the conversation. So that's part of the process of what we're doing now. So with that, uh, let me turn it over to Heather Peeler, uh, who will walk through the working group recommendations. Heather. Great. Uh, well, good afternoon, everybody. Good to see you all. Thank you so much for making the time to join us for today's conversation. And um, I also want to um, thank the council for uh, convening the working group and bringing us all together to um, tackle some of these issues. As David said, we've been discussing as a for a while um, in the sector. Uh, so as David said, this is very much a work in progress. And this conversation today is really going to help shape our collective thinking. And I'm really eager to hear some of the questions and, um, and to, be, uh, to have an active conversation with all of you this afternoon. So before we jump into the actual recommendations, we wanted to start out with um, a set of principles. Um, and we thought this was important as a working group, as a way to uh, ground our conversation and paint a, a vision for the value that donor advice funds um, bring to um, our society and, and our communities. Uh, we felt that it was very important, given the current discussions um, about donor advice funds, that we have a set of articulated values that could um, guide our work and our thinking. Uh, so uh, the um, principles that you'll see on the screen, um, well, I should say the, the, the principles and values that you see on the screen um, here, uh, ref again, reflect the thinking that our uh, working group have, had done over a six month period. But I wanna call to your attention three in particular that um, I, I think are, um, are just a, po a point of focus for us um, and for our conversation today. Um, so one is that we um, see DAFs as an incentive. They incentivize charitable giving and build a culture of philanthropy in our communities. Um, and our communities taking all shapes uh, and sizes, large and small, urban and rural, um, from all across the country. Um, the other principle that I think um, I wanted to uplift is around um, DAFs as being a, an efficient and flexible grant making tool that uh, can enable donors to adapt nimbly to changing community conditions and needs. And I think we all had firsthand experience with that um, during the, the pandemic and saw um, how powerful DAFs were in our communities and addressing um, uh, the emerging needs of our communities. And then the third principle um, I wanted to highlight is um, that DAFs enable donors to be strategic in their grant making over, over time. So um, not only do, do they play a role in supporting immediate needs, but they're there as a resource for our communities um, over the long run and um, can be used to support initiatives that have a, a long-term uh, horizon. Uh, so, um, and then the final um, one that I wanted to highlight is about, again, this relates to the, the timeline that DAFs serve as a, um, that they collectively serve as a perpetual resource to, to supply communities rapidly and responsibly. So the, uh, again, the long-term nature of donor advice funds we thought was very um, essential for us to um, note as we were uh, beginning our work on the recommendations. So next slide, thank you. Uh, so I'm going to talk about the first two recommendations that uh, have to do with inactive funds. And so building upon the principles that we developed, um, our working group identified five recommendations. Uh, and one critique that we've heard um, about DAFs um, for many years is that, um, that, that donors are contributing to their DAFs, but they're not making grants, that they're these um, inactive um, kind of pulled sources of support that uh, aren't, aren't being deployed um, to assist our communities. Uh, yet, as we all know, that the national standards for U.S. community foundations began to require that all accredited community foundations have um, have fund active have fund activity policy, and um, this is one of the things that we um, spoke about um, quite a bit uh, on on the working group. And I'm sure many of you um, also have your own um, fund policies. And so, we wanted to provide a set of recommendations that would. Uh, specifically tackle this issue of inactive funds. And so uh, we set out by uh, providing a standard definition of what an inactive fund is. So a fund um, that has had no distribution um, advised out of the fund for three consecutive years. 
Uh, we also uh, recommend that organizations have a standard procedure for classifying a fund as inactive, which um, could include a number of attempts to reach the donor and uh, the donor advisor. Uh, we also wanted to make sure that um, the, there were some allowances for um, some, some exceptions to classify a fund as inactive. And we all know our donors have um, different plans and goals and objectives for the use of their funds and for the charitable purpose of their funds. Um, and so we wanted to be um, sure that we weren't prescribing um, a one size fits all type of approach when it comes to um, categorizing uh, funds as inactive. And then finally, um, once a fund is, is, is classified as inactive, the community foundation can terminate the fund agreement. So it's not saying that if you uh, deem a fund inactive that um, you have to, it's just saying that that is one step that you can take um, as a community foundation um, and to uh, terminate uh, inactive funds. And this I think was something that we'll continue to talk about in the Q&A portion. Okay, so the next recommendation uh, builds on um, the, the, the previous recommendation around inactive funds. Uh, we would like to encourage the Treasury Department to issue a rule adding the percentage of inactive funds to Foundation's Form 990s. Uh, we think that this gives an added le level of um, transparency and accountability. Um, in addition um, to providing this percentage, we would ask that the Treasury include a section where foundations could provide additional context. So again, we know that it's not just um, a, a number that, um, that there's context to that number that would be on the 990 and that there would be the ability for all of us to um, provide some, some uh, commentary and context uh, for that inactive fund rate. We also believe that the percentage of inactive funds at most community foundations is very small. I know that's the case with, with my community foundation. I can certainly um, count those that are inactive. I know who those, those fund holders are, and I actually know why um, those, fund holders, uh, those funds are inactive. And I'm sure that's the case with many of you. Um, and then we know that there may be some funds that uh, meet the definition. And again, that most community foundations will likely know why that donor hasn't um, advised a grant out of that fund in three years. So um, those are the uh, recommendations that I was gonna walk through. So I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, Debbie on the working group to talk through the next two. Thank you. Thanks, Heather. So the third um, recommendation is really about that, miss, that idea that, well, we know that donor advised funds are paying out this record pace, but there is this idea that maybe they wouldn't have to. They do, they, and, and we wanted to think about that. So one thing that we all knew when we, when we hear about all the voices that are in this space right now, it's interesting because we're really all thinking the same thing. We want donors to use their donor advised fund for grant making. We want them to be impactful and effective tools um, it's just that we're all coming at it from different world views and world experiences. And, and for those of us who have worked with donors on every size in these in donor advised fund spaces, we knew that we had to create something that would say, look, we need to, you know, we're not afraid of a bottom line, like making sure that we grant out of our donor advised funds on mass, on whole, um, as much as private foundations do. But we don't want to put that idea in donors' minds and make that their issue because then they'll, they'll grant less. Um, what we see is this beautiful tool that they use to grant way more than any private foundation's grant. And so we also didn't want to create something that was overly complicated that would stop any donor from even just signing up for one, um, thinking, oh, that's too much for me to figure out. And actually for those of us on the administration side, trying to think about the complicated nature of tracking grants in and out of funds, we needed something that all of us on our systems could actually do. And so what we came up with was this, and it's really talking about not a donor by donor payout percentage, but something that I think we could all agree is that if we are in the space of administering donor advised funds for our donors, we all need to have systems or, or relationships in place that are encouraging them to use their funds, to keep them top of mind, to encourage them to give wildly during years of great need as we've seen them do during the pandemic. Um, and then put it on our side 
to say, look, as an organization, if a private foundation entity has to give out at a 5% payout, then that's fair as an entity administering donor advised funds for us to have a payout equal to 5%. I learned so much from um, the working group on all the different ways we work with donors in this space. Um, we had some of the conversations come up, some community foundations have endowed funds that they worried about, like, should we exclude those? And we did a lot of conversation about that and realized, I think if we look at these in total, it will all work out okay, even for those endowed funds. And especially if we recognize, just like private foundations, there's administrative costs that need to be included in that payout. Um, and, and, and as well, we went further and said, let's look at this over a period of time so that we can encourage donors to give more when there are urgencies that are have arisen in our communities, or our country, or our world, um, and look at it over a longer period of time so that in total, and I think all of us would say, if you are administering donor advised funds and you're not doing it in a way to make these funds really accessible and top of mind to your donors so that in the aggregate, you're not giving out 5%, maybe this isn't the business for you. Maybe you ought to be thinking, focused on different types of funds. And I think that's fair. I think as all of us that administer donor advised funds could say, yeah, on, we ought to have some, some baseline for that. So anyway, there's probably lots of conversations and things to think about in that space. Um, but that is, in our mind, that way of creating a floor without getting that in the minds of the donor's responsibility to think year in, year out about that 5%, because we all know a floor will become a ceiling for donors, and that's the last thing we wanna do. The next um, recommendation is about private foundation distributions to donor advised funds. I kind of thought this one would be easy as we started thinking about it, like, ah, oh, sure, yeah, you know, but we realized we're, uh, at least those of us on the working group, and I'm sure in this conversation, we all locally have such different relationships with private foundations in our community and the ways we're working with them. One thing I heard um, is, you know, we may be classifying some of the relationships we're, we're engaging with in private foundations as donor advised funds unnecessarily. To me, it sounds like there's other ways that some of these relationships can be classified. Remember, we're only thinking about our donor advised funds in this conversation. But we did think, okay, look, if it's not about a termination, we have lots of folks that say, you know what, this is too much, I'm getting a divorce, we're gonna terminate this private foundation, my husband's gonna go, my ex-husband's going his way, I'm going my way. You know, Those are terminations. We're not talking about the 5% distribution in those cases. But if a private foundation is trying to use their 5% distribution and put it into a donor advised fund, then yes, some time of payout should be appropriate. And in talking with lots of different people about this issue, um, it seemed like a five-year period seemed to be reasonable. Now, some of you may be saying, well, how am I going to know? How am I going to know if they're using it? And that's those are conversations with the private foundation. Remember, this is their distribution requirement. This is their 5% payout. Um, and so they may just need to partner with us and they're saying, yes, this is part of my 5% distribution and we'll need to work with you on some um, tracking or accountability around that. But this to me was the one that was so surprising because we have all lots of different ways we're working with um, private foundations. And I think that's the good news for community foundations. So that's the two that I was going to cover, I'm going to turn it over to Walker Sanders to cover the rest. Thank you, Debbie. I think I have the two easy ones that make all, all kinds of sense. The, uh, the two that I'm going over are the donation of complex assets and expanding charitable giving. As we all know, we've all gotten gifts of very of intangible personal property, private art, operating businesses, the gifts to donor advised funds. And this was really a, a recommendation to begin to have a, a unified conversation about a donation of complex assets to all 501c3s and not just to pull out donor advised funds. And initially part of the ASAC was to begin to eliminate all, pro all property being donated to donor advised funds. And we felt as a field, it was important to come together to develop some consistent policies 
around these types of contributions of complex assets, which are very important to not just the donor advised funds, but to other types of 501c3 organizations. So let's come together as a field to talk about that. The next recommendation, I don't think really needs any explanation. I think everyone on this call would 100% agree that we all would love to be able to, to encourage more and more individuals to give and uh, to recognize everyone who's given, regardless of that of the income level, uh, and also to allow um, distributions to from IRAs, QCDs to uh, donor advised funds. I think there's probably there's not a year that goes by that we don't field dozens of phone calls asking from professional advisors and others, can my donor give to their donor advised, my client give their donor advised fund from their IRA? And uh, while they can give to regular 501c3s, which that's done, can we? If we could give two donor advised funds, it would be uh, important to do. And I think now the, the time is right. We've seen that in, in crisis times, that depending on the report you've read, that even during the pandemic, giving grants from donor advised funds increased in some reports over 30%. And I think we're hopefully what we'll see from all these recommendations that by coming together as a field and speaking to Congress with one common voice, we can begin looking at donor advised funds in kind of more of a an inclusive light and not just looking at donor advised funds from a perspective of a few bad apples that have done some practices that have raised it have gotten the attention of a few Congress folks. Let's come together, talk, collect with a few, look at the positive aspects of donor advised funds and the impact that they're having on philanthropy. So I look forward to a, the discussion going forward. I think I'm turning it back to you, Christy. Is that right? Yeah, excellent. Thank you. And so Melissa, at this point, we are opening up um, the chat. We're going to open up the Q&A feature. And I'm also going to be looking around for those of you that might be um, raising your hands with questions. And I think I will get us started as we're organizing that and as you're hopefully typing away. Um, and David, I'm going to, I'm going to point to you on this one, because I think you'll remember and I bet I see heads nod of others who were on the um, who were on the working group. There was a lot of conversation about: Are we talking about community foundation uh, donors advised funds only, or should we be talking about um, all donor advised fund sponsors as we're talking about recommendations related to DAFs? And do you want to sort of um, synthesize the hours of conversation we had about that and talk a little bit about where we're at with these and why? Sure. I mean, I think that the, the feeling was we think that these, the working group said they, they think that these recommendations should apply to all DAF sponsors. But just like we wouldn't want private foundations to say we've decided this for community foundations, that it, it wasn't really fair without having some conversations with other parts of the sector to get feedback on them on these recommendations. Um, so that, that was the kind of next step is we think these should. We think these make sense for everybody, but we want to get everybody's feedback because you know this is a process of getting feed, of get, getting feedback so we can get the the right things that will really help the sector to achieve its goals. Excellent. You know the other piece before you before you unmute the other piece that we talked a lot about is you know is this in response to the ACE Act? Is this going to become our own um, set of sort of policy uh, recommendations and ultimately a piece of legislation? Do you want to synthesize that conversation as well and, and level set uh, kind of where we were? Sure, sure. So look, you know, the ASA Act is out there. Um, you know, some folks love it, some folks hate it, and everybody in between, and that's fine. But I think the purpose of the working group was to say, here's some things we, we are for. So it wasn't trying to be in response to anything, but really just to have some ideas to move the conversation forward. And so our plan is not in the near term to introduce legislation. Um, because we really think this is a starting point where we can get lots of ideas and feedback. So ultimately, hopefully, we can have some ideas that make sense. You know, I mean, uh, the, the, these concerns aren't going away. We need to have some things reform. Excellent. All right. This is, um, here's one about um, community foundation investment policies. Was there consideration about community foundation investment policies in relation to the 5% distribution requirement? Please share more. So there's some 
sense of what will investment returns look like. I don't know if that's also perhaps related to spending policy a little bit. And one piece to add in this is the 5% entity level also does take into, we can count administrative fees um, in that distribution requirement as well. But Debbie, you've unmuted. Do you have a comment on that at all? Sure. Um, and there were a couple of good comments in the chat about this. We all of the things you're thinking and in, in that chat were lots of conversations that we had as well. So I'm very interested in your perspective on that. What person's concern about that being, you know, becoming a ceiling. And I think what we're trying to do is make sure that's a requirement on the sponsor side. It doesn't go fund by fund um, because it shouldn't be, a, you know, regardless of investment pol policies, we ought to at least be able to do what a private foundation can do in terms of the overall grant making, which also in brings into account investments and which also brings into account expenses and grants. Uh, but I also think we have to be fair to donors at every level of philanthropy that they ought to be able to give over of the long term and perhaps even throughout their life with a donor advised fund. And a 5% distribution um, has seemed to work quite well on the private foundation side. So I think we don't want to put donor advised funds in a worse space than we might see in the private foundation sector. But it is really important that we would administer that at an entity level, sort of behind the scenes 990 work that isn't going to be hard. It's not gonna be an administrative mm -hmm. burden on any of us, um, but, but we ought to, keep allowing our donors to give and give and give freely at their pace, and they will do so. Eddie, I would kind of add to what you're saying as well to that, you know, a lot of the spending policies that we all have is really dealing with our permanent assets that we manage and it's the, the permanent distribution we're making for our own grant, discretionary grant making. And if we look at the aggregate, as Debbie emphasized, many of us are making grants from the, are they out on the aggregate of donor advice funds of 15, 20% a year. So we're well exceeding a 5% payout. And there was a, um, a couple of members of the working group really wanted to make sure there was a rollover of 20 quarters, which really does kind of tie back to many of our spending policies uh, that are looking at our, our permanent assets. And again, this is really trying to come together as a field to have one common voice uh, and talk just as one in entity, not all of us going separately to all of our various Congress, uh, Congress representatives and saying our own opinions about it, but to have one collective voice so that we as a field can kind of head this off. They were heading down a road of uh, requiring a 5% payout on a per fund basis. Well, for the larger community militia, they may be able to come up with the administrative support to do that. For the smaller community militia, this would be a disaster to do. And by collecting it out on an aggregate basis really allows us as a field uh, to allow it, whether it's a smaller foundation or a larger foundation, we can manage that collectively. And I think Debbie made those points. Just want to reemphasize that. Mm -hmm. Good, thank you. A quick question. Uh, would these recommendations apply to all donor advice funds, retroactive and new? And I think that that would be true. It would be, it, at our viewpoint, it would apply to all. Um, and Christy, if I could just add, I mean, one of the real principles that we had here was to try to make things administratively as simple as possible. Because, you know, the idea of like, you'd have to track the old ones and the new ones with different sets of rules, it's just more complexity. So that, so really trying to make it as simple as possible. David, while you're on, um, someone asked the question or just made the observation. There, there are a lot of um, donor advice fund sponsors or other groups looking into the, those who care about philanthropy, looking into this issue. Um, some of us are engaged with Jeff Hammond's work. Others have been um, working with other groups. What conversations, you've been having lots of conversations, what conversations are happening, have happened, um, so that we don't risk appearing disjointed, but really truly that we're coming together with this sort of better together spirit? It's a great question. So, you know, we've had a lot of conversations with Jeff and, um, you know, a lot of the people who are part of that group are part of, uh, we're part of the working group, make sure that we're all working together because clearly when we work together, we're much more likely to be successful. Um, and we've had other conversations with United Plan 3 Forum, with, I mean, uh, lots of other PSOs too, um, to try to just, you know, again, get input and to see if we can come together on some recommendations. So I think that's going to be a process over time, but we've had 
lots and lots of uh, lots of conversations with with those different groups. I'll open this up for anybody's observation because I think it, it's pretty accurate. One chronic issue um, when in some of this conversation about donor advice fund reform is the lack of data um, to back up the claims about either alleged, allegedly what's going wrong with them, that they're being warehoused, et cetera, or and how they're being used. What uh, data sources did this working group draw upon in crafting the principles and recommendations? I can tackle that and ask my colleagues to, to join in. Um, the main data source was our own individual experience. I, mean, I think one of the great things about the working group was that it included um, community foundations of all sizes um, from very large to uh, very small and um, that we could draw on our, um, I think, diverse experiences and working with uh, fund holders and um, our diverse experiences in managing donor advised funds. So to me, that was, I think, really powerful um, and my uh, opinion or thoughts on issues changed as I heard from my colleagues and um, some of the um, considerations that they had that were different from um, my context at my community foundation. So I think our individual experiences um, being representative of the broader field um, was very powerful. Um, and, and I think that was very influential, at least for me as a member of the working group in thinking through the recommendations. Any other comment on data? I think I know just I even just in Iowa. Add. Oh, go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. Go, go ahead, Chrissy. Well, I just know even in in Iowa, our community foundation network, we're we're constantly grappling with what's the right data to be collecting. How to you know, and how are we using that with legislators? And we've even you know modified it this year in response to to some of this to to better tell the story, um, and and just make sure that we're accurate in our storytelling as well. David, sorry. Go ahead. No, no, no. I was just going to say. So we did look at the 990 data that's available, um, and we looked at you know all kinds of other uh, data that's available. I think the one thing that I will say is that I think one of the strengths of the recommendation, or one of the challenges, that we don't know exactly how many, what percentage of, of funds are inactive, and that's made it so that. Some people saying there are tons and some people saying, you know, there are very few. And so I think that by having a standard and active funds policy as the working group suggested, hopefully that would give us the actual data so that we can as a field really decide it's a big problem, it's really not a problem or, or, or how to move forward. Mm -hmm. That leads, Debbie, were you gonna say something? I was just gonna add that the idea here with them practices is, you know, the idea of what behaviors we as administrators of donor advised funds need to be encouraged to do. Like, we're so busy with those active funds because they're, they're active and they're busy. And so this gives us an opportunity to say, all right, let me, let me point my direction to the folks that aren't so busy, that aren't active. Um, and I think the data, the more, most importantly, I think, you know, some of us may have these little funds that, you know, a few hundred dollars in them that nobody remembered. It's really understanding the size of the assets in those funds that are inactive, not the number of funds that are inactive. So that's where the data comes into play. Well, and I think, um, you know, we had a lot of conversation too about, you know, national standards already requires an inactive fund policy. So, you know, is there any role for national standards in this? And um, shoot, I had a part two, but there it goes. David, is there any role for national standards in this? Absolutely, I'm just wondering if Susie Nelson would wanna address that. Susie on, and then I guess the part two of that question is what happens if you're not meeting the requirements um, that we're pushing out here? What's, you know, what are the ramifications for a community foundation then? TBD. You want me to go? Please. <laughs> Okay, so for uh, national standards, this is, um, we were, uh, I'm, I'm chair of the National Standards Board, and we um, were, we presented all of these recommendations to our board at last week's meeting. So it is something that we're going to be reviewing. We also have our own um, donor advised fund working group that's going to be looking into all of this as we move forward. So absolutely, I mean, they're going to play a role. Um, 
you know, the entire time that we met, um, I kept lifting up the fact that we have national standards to fall on and a lot, um, you know, I think a lot in the industry who aren't intimately aware of the inner workings of community foundations are not aware of national standards. So I think that's something we um, definitely need to lift up and, um, and share with um, those who are making these types of decisions for us. Excellent. Um, someone suggested that perhaps CF Insights could assist with some of the data tracking. Someone had a question about, um, is there data from large commercial organizations that hold DAFs? And indeed, I think some of them have studies, you know, that have been out that do share uh, sort of the spending rate that they're seeing. One question is, who exactly are we making this recommendation to? Chrissy, who would you like to answer that? I think you. Me. Okay, there you go. <laughs> um, so um, I think it's really to uh, to the world. I mean, it's it's to here's some ideas, and uh, it's to I mean, ultimately we want to share these with policymakers. Um, a number of them are um, they would have to be changed change at the regulatory or legislative level, but. Um, but it's to the sector, it's to, you know, here's some ideas to move forward the conversation. I don't know if anybody in the working group would want to add to that, but. I believe uh, Steve is also having some conversations with some of the national donor advised fund sponsors too. And it was really began to, for us to begin to collectively talk with one voice and, and not try to hit them from five different perspectives from five different types of sponsoring organizations around donor advised funds. That, and, I do think as a, as a field of just community foundation, which kind of speaks to why we were talking from just a community foundation perspective, is we, have a, we need to start changing the dialogue around who we are as a field, uh, as collective community foundations. We have, for 30 years I've been in this work, there's this phrase that I think is the worst phrase that's ever been passed around how community foundation says, if you've seen one community foundation, you've seen one community foundation. Well, it gives you this entity that there are 800 different types of us around the country. And I think we need to change that dialogue to start saying, if you've seen one community, you have seen one community foundation because we share the same values. We serve a geographic area. We have a local board. We manage endowments for that geographic area. We address issues in that geographic area. We're not different because some of us focus more on community leadership. Some of us focus more on their advice funds or some of us focus more on permanent grant making we all still share those same common values. And for us as a field to begin to have that conversation with elected leaders, we need to have that collective voice that we share those same values. And I think where we are with this donor advised fund conversation is that first step in a much larger conversation as collectively kind of exercising our influence with our legislators, but doing it as a, as a field and not as individuals, individual community foundations. That's sorry. I know the working group's going, oh my God, he's back on his soapbox again. Uh, but I just felt it's important for us to kind of keep putting that out there. And I think that's why we we sort of took a step back and, and started with really the principles that we agree on um, to really level set what we're all about when it comes to DAFs. Nancy in Winona, I see your hand up. Yeah, I wanted to respond to, you know, who are we sharing these with? I can share that I have been an active member of the Association of Fundraising Professionals. And I can tell you that they are um, aggressively talking about the ACE Act. And there is a very strong feeling of uh, the professional frontline fundraisers that DAFs are icky. And um, if, we, if, if we know that there are other associations, whether it's AFP or other nonprofit associations that truly don't understand why donor advised funds are an important tool in building philanthropy, then we need to um, position ourselves as the experts that we are and demonstrate that um, donor advised funds are not icky and that they're a nonprofit's friend. Um, because the assumption that all of a sudden the dollars that are trapped or hoarded in a donor advised fund are instantly going to go to the good, the better good, is, um, I, I think, a little naive. Um, people do are motivated 
by taxes for some philanthropic reasons. And the dollars will flow to the nonprofit, but by giving someone a vehicle or a tool to um, maximize their tax advantage through a donor advised fund is a good thing. It's not a bad thing. Thank you, Nancy. There's a, there's a comment and sort of question in the chat that I think is a fair one. Um, how do you respond to the question that we're providing solutions to a problem that does not exist? Because we've, some of us have used that. And by putting these out there, we're stating that the ACE folks are right. Um, and does this open the door for additional claims? Any thoughts about that from our conversation starters or others on the call? Just go back to what Walker said in terms of providing um, a common set of talking points and recommendations that um, those of us from across the field can use so that when and, and or if the, you know, ACE Act um, takes on more momentum, um, there's not you know, hundreds of different uh, perspectives. We're a, presenting a unified um, front um, to legislators. So I, I think that's important for us to organize ourselves and um, come into alignment now um, before um, it becomes, you know, I think a little bit more um, um, active in terms of the, the ACE Act. There are a couple of questions about- I would, the, just, I would just add, if, if I could, Christy, I, I think yeah. that, you know, the view from Capitol Hill is uh, there's so much other stuff going on, this isn't their top focus, but, you know, for those who think about in Capitol Hill, the perception is that there is an issue here. And so around DAF. So I think that, um, you know, I don't think we're creating um, that perception, but I think by having some intelligent, some, some ideas, I think that actually helps us to show policymakers that, um, you know, here's some good ideas, let's have a dialogue. Well, I'm glad to have the heads up about the nonprofit community because I'm doing a presentation on DAFs next week to our. Mid-Iowa Plan Giving Council. Richard, I see your hand up. Yeah, thank you. Um, I really wanna thank the council and the work group for putting this together. Several of us have been asking, how could we develop a positive set of reforms that we can lead with rather than playing defense? And it's been a vacuum for several years in the field and true appreciation for taking it on. Um, David, I'm going to put you slightly on the spot, if that's all right. Um, last summer, several of us were on the phone. I think Debbie was there. Steve was there. We had a, a phone call with Senator Wyden, who chairs Senate Finance, and his top staff person who said, we need to know what you guys can live with. Can you provide a list of reforms that community foundations could get behind? So David, thinking about if you got a call from the Senate Finance Committee chairman uh, or staff who said, we're moving on the ACE Act. Um, we need a list of recommendations that community foundations could um, advance and get behind to reform DAFs. Would you share this list? Well, you know, uh, it's a good, great question. And thank you for putting me on the spot like this. Um, I, uh, no, no, I think it's a good question. I. Um, you know, I don't think that it doesn't appear that with everything else that Congress has on its plate that, that ACE Act or really anything is going to move this year. So I think we have time to have these conversations and to think about what does make sense. Um, you know, I, I think part of whenever that call comes, um, whether that's, you know, in a month or two years, I am very hopeful that by having done this homework by having had these six months of conversations and then the conversation today and all the subsequent conversations that as a field, we've really tried to think through what are some things that make sense? Um, because we don't know when that call is gonna come and we wanna be prepared. Nick, I'll give a less political answer. Hell yes. I think the point was to kind of have a a common set of things we agree with and say, yes, this is where we're, this is what we agree with as a field. We, we have one voice. Uh, we recognize that y'all are moving down a road of some changes. We wanna be proactive and uh, we've discussed this as a field and these are things that we all believe we can live with. So that I don't wanna speak for the rest of the working group and don't wanna 
I know David had to have a little more of a political answer, but I'll give you my non-political answer. Well, and some of them are not legislative in nature, you know, Walker. So some of them don't need to go to Congress. They need to go somewhere else. So um, they're, they're a mixed, um, um, you know, a mixed group of things. There's some good conversation in the chat. Um, you know, let's see, it was a, uh, Wonder if there needs to be more language about the tremendous impact maps have in our communities, particular communities of color. Um, I think that's a, a great comment. It's clear that data is needed. It's clear that storytelling works. And then I think down a little further, um, need to be we all need to be speaking with our legislators and keeping them educated on the positive aspects of DAF. So you know we take that on ourselves as something definitely needed to add to our plate right now. The, um, a summary of the recommendations uh, is in the chat for you all. And because our time is limited on our roundtable, there is an opportunity to submit feedback directly to the council uh, on that website. And you'll see that in the chat as well. Others that wanna lend a voice to the conversation? Just saw you planning to survey community foundations to get feedback. So I think continuing to push that um, opportunity to submit feedback is important to encourage. If some of you belong to statewide um, community foundation networks, feel free to uh, push that out and encourage. Encourage the conversation, pull together, run through the slides and, and talk about what, what these would look like in your communities. Um, all right. Is there a timeline for when feedback is needed, David? I mean, you know, it, as, as soon as you have some feedback, we'd love to hear it. But, you know, I think this is going to be a process that's going to take some time. So it, mm -hmm. there isn't a specific deadline. All right. Anything else, Jen or Melissa, that you're seeing there? Okay. Well, I, I hope that you all will join me in thanking the council and in thanking uh, the ad hoc work group members. Again, those were meetings over six months um, of very busy time and really some dedicated time and dedicated and diligent conversation um, to thoughtfully uh, come up with these recommendations that we believe uh, can work as a starting point for our field. At the Community Foundation of Greater Des Moines, our mantra is we're simply better together. And I believe that mantra is especially true for our field and donor advice fund policy moving forward. I'd also like to lift up CEO Net. We're now over 60 members strong and working to build programming and content to help all of you serve your organizations and communities better. To learn more, you can go to the website at ceonet.org. We're actively seeking a part-time director to help us deliver more content and opportunities for all of you. And we're planning our first in-person retreat for hopefully this fall, so stay tuned. Very pleased to offer these CEO roundtables in collaboration with the Council on Foundations. Please stay tuned for information on the next roundtable scheduled for May 24th at three o'clock Eastern time. So mark your calendars and we'll be having the discussion topic of gifts of cryptocurrency. So I think that will be very interesting and we hope to bring some real resources to you in that work. In the meantime, if you do have resources, questions, or would like to serve as a conversation lead for that topic, you can be in touch with me, Naus, uh, K-N-O-U-S at Des Moines Foundation.org. Thank you all again. And remember, we are better together.